This is Michael Popak, Legal AF. We have some breaking news. The criminal defense team for Donald Trump is using the civil case for civil rape that started today involving E. Jean Carroll as a test run for them to figure out how juries receive Donald Trump and to help them in their criminal case. Let's start with the beginning. E. Jean Carroll's civil rape case started today in federal court in New York. Day one, picked a jury. I'll talk about that jury in a moment. We don't know their names, but we know their biographical details. Six men and three women sit in the jury box of nine people, along with three alternates. And who else is in that courtroom? Not a counsel table trying the case. That would be Joe Tacopina, Alina Haba, Mike Mattio, and a couple of other lawyers that work with Joe Tacopina. But who was in the gallery of the courtroom? Sitting on the other side of the bar today, Susan Necklace and Todd Blanche, who are the lead criminal defense lawyers for Donald Trump in the state court prosecution brought by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg for 34 felony counts. And sitting next to them, a jury consultant, somebody that's that's paid to help lawyers pick jurors to identify the prototypical perfect juror, if such a thing exists, and to help select them from questionnaires, the selection process, which we call voir dire, and uh, background profiles and other research and information. Research and information that, frankly, is not available to Donald Trump and his legal team or any of the lawyers involved in this case, in the civil case, in the E. Jean Carroll rape case, because the judge, to protect the jury has made them anonymous, meaning that the lawyers only learned about their identity right at the time of selection, not before. They didn't get, sometimes you get a list of the jurors in advance with some of their vital details, you know, about uh, their age, educational background, where they live, where they work, that type of thing. The the, uh, lawyers in the civil rape case got none of that information. Why is Todd Blanche, Susan Necklace, and the jury consultants sitting and watching because they want to see this as a test run or a dress rehearsal for how juries, male, female, depending upon their socioeconomic background, react to Donald Trump and the concept of Donald Trump. Or as Joe Tacopina today said, said in the opening, to test out this theory, this working theory, in front of the criminal defense lawyers, friends of his sitting in the courtroom. He said to the jury, you may hate my client. You may hate Donald Trump, and that's okay. But the place to express that is in secret at the election in the ballot box, not here in the courtroom. So they're already testing out mutual themes and thematics that the civil lawyers and the criminal lawyers will try to use to defend Donald Trump. They are working together. This is not an accident that Susan Necklace Todd Blanche and the jury consultant for the other case, the criminal case against Donald Trump, are sitting together watching Joe Tacopina try his case and select his jury. Because they also want to see who's going to make, who's going to be the right juror for Donald Trump in a criminal case, in a business record fraud, tax fraud case. That is the question. So let's just do the rundown of what they're seeing from their perspective. They're seeing a jury that was selected in the civil rape case that's comprised of the following. A 37-year-old father who works at the New York Public Library and gets his information primarily through Google and anything on the internet. A 64-year-old physical therapist mother who lives in the Bronx and watches CNN. A 26-year-old retail worker in Manhattan who says that she uses social media to obtain her news a 46-year-old former janitor who doesn't really watch much of anything, a 55-year-old mother who works in the healthcare field in collections, and she'll watch anything, that's her self-description, a 60-year-old father from a more conservative uh, area of New York who studied computer coding and works in a hospital and is a chattel flipper, a 62-year-old Spanish-speaking mom in the Bronx who watches CNN, And then a 31-year-old security guard, also from the Bronx, who avoids news. He likes to listen to podcasts, especially ones by right-wing commentators. That's the jury. That's the nine in the box. 
And so they're watching people like that right-wing podcast person. They're seeing how Trump does with women, at least the three women that are on the jury, and how he does with men. Does that matter? Should they move to pick more men than women or vice versa when they pick the criminal jury? So this is a test run, a dress rehearsal for what they're going to do at the criminal side. They're picking up information, data, and color from the civil case. And they're going to try to use it to to, uh, uh, Donald Trump's benefit in the criminal case. Now, that doesn't mean that Alvin Bragg and his prosecutors can't sit in the courtroom as well. And if I were them, I'd probably hightail it over to the federal courthouse, the Moynihan courthouse, and take a seat in the galleries themselves because they should see how a Donald Trump case that has criminal implications, although it's a civil case, a civil rape case, if you will, how that plays out with a New York jury because their jury pool is similar. It's a little bit different. The Southern District of New York is the federal jury, and that pulls from a larger pool, a more diverse uh, ge- geographic pool than the New York State jury pool. That's more Manhattan centric. The jury pool for the Southern District takes into account places like Westchester and Far Rockaways and other places like that, which have different socioeconomic components to it. So there's a limit to the um, how much of in this information is going to be that useful. But certainly the defense is using every opportunity in the criminal case to try to get an advantage. And um, we haven't seen reporting about who's in the courtroom. But if, if the Manhattan DA is not there, they should get over there. Let's take a quick break to talk about our next partner, Zbiotics. Now, if you're like me, you've probably skipped a workout because of drinks the night before. Like, it happens. But if you're committed to your healthy routine, you need Zbiotics. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Now, I can't lie, after we hit 1 million subscribers, I may have partied a little bit too much that night. But luckily, I knew I had Zbiotics. Now, as instructed, I drank a bottle of Zbiotics before any alcohol, and I was amazed at just how good I felt the next day. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash legalaf to get 15% off your first order when you use Legal AF at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So remember, head to zbiotics.com slash Legal AF and use the code Legal AF at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. So the reporting for right now on this hot take is that you've got Donald Trump using not artificial intelligence, well, not yet anyway, but intelligence from the courtroom by having his criminal lawyers watch every day, I would imagine, of the civil case to see how Donald Trump plays in front of a New York jury and then make some decisions along with the jury consultant who's hired and paid for, or at least hired by Donald Trump, in order to determine what is the appropriate um, uh, jury or juror composition. What are they looking for? Does it matter whether they're college educated? Does it matter whether they're professional? Does it matter whether they're high school graduates? Does it matter whether they get most of their news from social media or from traditional news, mainstream news media, or or they're not into news at all? Um, what they, they're, they're, those that that's information and takeaways for the calculus that the jury consultant is going to use. They may even test this out by doing a, what we call a moot court or a use a mock jury where they actually hire people, pay them to be jurors, you know, fake jurors, if you will. And then they present their case 
and somebody presents the prosecution that's the best they can, and they see what the reaction is to the jury, this paid jury, and then they make alterations in the way they present their case at trial based on the information that they obtain by paying uh, for the jury. That's another thing a jury consultant can do. They can help put on these mock juries, maybe up to 20 people, two separate sets of jurors, and they run the case in front of them and see how it plays out, run it up the flagpole, and then make adjustments in the actual presentation at trial. That's another role of a jury consultant. And they often are in the courtroom with a clipboard, helping to pick the jury, going back and forth with the lawyers as the lawyers use their challenges, because that's the, that's the jury selection process. The judge will bring down 40, 50, 60, even 100, depending upon the size of the courtroom, potential jurors from, we call the jury, we call it the jury panel or the juror panel or veneer. They bring them down and then they start their selection process. In federal court, the judge does most of the talking, asking lots of questions, some of which are provided by the lawyers, some of, most of which he develops on his own. That's what happened in federal court today with E. Jean Carroll. Sometimes they use a, a questionnaire in advance. The judge in today did not use that. The state court, they may. In the state court, the lawyers do more of the selection process, not the judge. Gives the lawyers the opportunity to start building some credibility, authenticity, and um, persuasiveness with the jury. Try out a few of their themes by the way they ask their questions. See what the jury's reaction to that is. So in the state court, it's more lawyer-driven. In the federal court, it's more judge-driven how they select the jurors. And all the while, you're con if you have a jury consultant, you consult with that person. And they tell you, well, number four looks terrible. Number eight juror. I like number eight juror. Here's the reasons. Um, the, uh, number 12 was nodding in the wrong direction when we were making our, our comments. So let's get rid of that person. And how do the jurors get rid of that person? There's two ways to get rid of jurors. One way is what's called a challenge for cause. The other way is called a peremptory challenge. A challenge for cause is what it sounds like. The person has demonstrated by the way they've answered their questions that they are not capable of being fair and impartial. It's not that they don't know anything about the case. You know, we're not looking for people who are lobotomized. It's okay if they know who Donald Trump is. Question is, can they be fair and impartial? And so if they can't be, for many, many reasons, or they can't speak the language, for instance, and there's because there's no there's no interpreters that are used in this process. Then they're excused for cause, right? But then each of the two sides, the plaintiff and the defendant, have peremptory challenges, usually about five, six, somewhere around that, and they can use it for any reason. I don't like the guy's tie, number three. I don't like the lady's haircut, number four, like that. And they literally check them off the box, and they they get excused, leaving whatever amount of jurors you need. In federal court, it's between six and 12. They, they use nine for the E. Jean Carroll case today, so nine jurors. In, uh, in criminal court in New York, it could be as low as six. It can also go up to 12. And the judge is going to decide on that one, how many they're going to need there. And then the, the judge has the same decision in the New York State Court, criminal court, about whether the jury is going to be anonymous or not. That decision has yet to be made. I'm sure Judge Mershon is following Judge Kaplan in today's civil case to see how the jury's doing and how the lawyers are doing and making sure there's no abuse of the jurors and how the followers of Donald Trump are doing and whether they're being respectful of the jury and judge and judicial system or they're not. And these are things I'm going to follow on hot takes. I'm doing a hot take every day with my co-anchor on Legal AF, Ben Mycellus, at the end of each trial day in E. Jean Carroll, we're doing a hot take wrap up of our analysis as practicing trial lawyers about what's really going on in that room. We did one today. We'll do one tomorrow. We'll do one all five to seven days of the trial. And then I co-anchor uh, the leading podcast on law and politics at the intersection of really politically charged litigation called Legal AF on the Midas Touch Network. And then you can follow everything I do on social media at MS Popak. And if you like this kind of hot take and you want this content to keep coming at you, give me a thumbs up. It helps. It helps with the reviews and it helps with the uh, algorithm. And you can leave a comment. I do read them. Uh, I get a lot out of them. <laughs> I, I do respond to some of them. 
But uh, this is what we do here at Legal AF. This is what we do every week on, on the Midas Touch Network. I'm Michael Popak for Legal AF. Hey, Midas Mighty, love this report? Continue the conversation by following us on Instagram, at Midas Touch, to keep up with the most important news of the day. What are you waiting for? Follow us now.